Our sponsors this week are Wayne Walker Quality Meats. Everything you need for everyday meals. Quality meats at affordable prices. You can find all the information within the description. They are located in Great Howard Street. Give them a follow. Thank you. And today's special guest is none other than former boxer Jamie Moore, boxing pundit. Thanks for coming on, mate. Sound Bill, no worries, mate. Yeah, so uh, tell me a little bit about your story. Let's start from the beginning. Growing up, what was it like growing up in Manchester, Salford, especially in. Um, it's all right, you know. I your think, boxing um, career? Yeah, growing up was like, I think everyone, a boxing in general, they have this sort of stereotypical come from a council estate rough you know but and 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 generally it is true um but i love my upbringing i've got to say you know we, we didn't have much at all as kids i'd like to say t typical sort of story but you know i never felt like i was i didn't have anything in terms of like neglected and stuff like that i was well loved good family um, just not much money and uh, and I, you know, old school, you know what it's like growing up in, in, in the 80s, it was it was the best times, I think, everyone looking back now going, I wish I was grew, growing up in the 80s where he was climbing trees and out all day and no one my gym, no one had phones and that, you know what I mean? So, uh, so yeah, it was good. Yeah, but, sure, but Manchester back in the day was a bit, um, it was it was quite, it was on the map for like a lot of trouble, weren't it? Yeah. Like, I mean, Salford's like, is that the, the, the outskirts in Manchester? Salford, it comes under Greater Manchester, yeah. but it's, it's, it's a city in its own right, so everyone from Salford's got a bit of a bean about it when they say, oh, you're from Manchester, and they always go, no, nah, I'm from Salford. Things which, like, which technically is right, you know yeah. what I mean? So, uh, but it was back, you know, a lot of um, car theft back in the day, you know, and yeah. I remember staying at my nana's on Odsall and hearing the car screeching around the estate um, yeah. at night, you know, I must have been seven or eight. And uh, the police like going up to the window and watching the police chasing around and all that. Yeah. So uh, it's good entertainment. There was loads of uh, like growing up, and I because I grew up in that era, 80s, 90s. It was all Pepper yeah, Hill, yeah. the Gooch. Yeah, yeah. There was yeah, lots yeah. of uh, there was lots of, uh, a lot of gang gangs, gang culture then. and stuff like that. Yeah, of course. And uh, you know, I think to a certain extent that still is the case. You yeah. know what I mean? But I think any inner city stuff like that, Moss Side and. You get it in London a lot. Liverpool has the same thing. Yeah. Around the outskirts, the city centres, you, you, you've got a lot of um, gang culture like that. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of people now trying to go, you know, get things into place, especially these stuff like pit, uh, gloves up, knives down and stuff like that. Yeah. I love them uh, people who are trying to do better in the community. And I think amateur boxing clubs go a long way to, to getting kids on, on the straight and narrow and getting them on the right track. Well, it is like there's a lot of uh, boxing clubs that are like supporting all that kind of stuff. Weapons down, gloves up, knives down. There's 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 there's, there's lots because do you know that the, it creates a lot of discipline, routine. Yeah. Somewhere to go, bit of banter, having a laugh. And, and I think the, a lot of the people who get involved in stuff like that, um, it's not like the bad people in a sense. It's like they're, they're in a bad situation and they might not have a lot of them. The, the dads aren't around, so they don't have that sort of figure to look look up to and yeah. you know that role model um and they walk in a boxing gym an amateur boxing club and the coach is that male yeah. adult role model who tells them you know they want discipline they want to be told what to do they've not got no guidelines they're left to their own devices yeah. and then they're in a situation where they're out on the streets and they're vulnerable you know what yeah. i mean that they, they, they feel scared in a way so knives are the safest way for them to look after themselves yeah. and it's not the way but it's the only way that they feel safe. So I think 90% of the time, it's a defense mechanism, you know yeah. what I mean? It's to look after self. Fear. And yeah, so yeah. But, but when you get him into it, you know, Nigel Travis has done wonders in Moss Side with that boxing club, because, you know, his, his, his sort of thing with the kids is, don't be part of a gang, be part of this gang. Yeah. Come in here, you know, they have, they have people from different parts of the, the areas all coming in the same gym, no trouble whatsoever, because they've all got respect. And it's like a safe haven. Yeah. You know, it's like they go in there. It doesn't matter where you're from, your colour, your creed, your religion. You're all part of that same team. So um, I think that's what boxing, amateur boxing clubs in, in general yeah. bring to a community, especially in, in rough areas. Well, you said it before, you like, uh, the contributing factors that lead to people's behaviour outside the households. It's like there's something going on at home. 
yeah. for getting bullied at school. And today's in, the, in today's day and age, it's like it's all that cyber bullying as well. Yeah. Instagram, Facebook, the worst Twitter, th that's the worst, isn't it? It's, 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 social media, in, you know, in general, yeah. is a horrible place. It, it, is. Has, it, it has its tools. It's an addictive place as well. It, it has yeah. its tools yeah. and it has a lot of, especially during this last 12 months, has been horrendous for everyone. So it's been a godsend in many ways because yeah. it's kept people occupied and stuff like this where you can get interviews with people and put it out there and it passes time for people while, yeah. while they're locked up in housing. So in that sense, it's a godsend. But on the other side of it, you know, it's, you get online bullying, harassment. Um, and it, there's all different levels to it and a different reasoning behind it, but it's, a lot of the time it's a bad place to be. Yeah, well, what do you think of him? Um, see, like, you know, we're, on, we're in all this, we're in constant lockdown. We're on, we're off, we're on, we're off. Yeah, yeah. You know, people's um, mental health, the suffering with it, aren't they? Let's have it right. Massively. You know, it's, it's a big thing, especially when, like, the gym. You know, we're in your gym, you're a professional, you've got professional elite boxers, yeah. you're training. You know, but what about those people that, uh, that struggle, that can't, like, go to gyms and the same, go outside and say, have you seen how cold it is? Exactly. And oh, yeah. so that, the first lockdown, when it was warm, yeah, it was so it was much jam, easier. Yeah, everyone yeah. everyone recognises, you know, it was so much easier. You could go and train outside in the park, go for your run, whatever, walks all the time. It's brutal now when it's cold. Um, and I think that's a massive area of this where they've overlooked it, is people's mental health. Um, I, I, I'm probably one of the most positive people I've ever come across. Sometimes I struggle to find any negative in any situation. I've struggled in patches yeah. during lockdowns because, and I've been all right in terms of, We've been allowed to come to the gym, yeah. so God knows what it's been like for people who struggle by nature. Do you know what I mean? And then they put in this situation. See what it is, right? It's not like it's not only like people's like like not being able to go to the gym. It's staying at home and at, it's eating. You find yourself in the fridge a lot, don't you? And you do. And more food. The and gym, you wait. The it's gym is their lot. way yeah. of bringing themselves back into a good place yeah. mentally. Yeah. So they've been deprived of that, and that's that's for me. That's wrong. You know. They've kept A and E open for people who are who are in a bad way physically, but what about people who are in a really bad way mentally? Okay, they can they can turn up at A and E and go, listen, I'm really struggling, and I feel like I'm suicidal. But 99% of people who are feeling like that aren't going to do that. They're just going to do something about it. Yeah. So that's not fair. You know, they, they, they neglected people's mental health massively, I think. And you know, I've made an advert on the radio at the moment about it. That's too late. They should have thought of that when they started locking people up and thinking because they know the impact what locking people up has on people's mental health a lot of the time. Yeah, so it creates a lot of anxiety and you know, I totally agree with all that. Um, and there's no place for people to go. And yeah, we understand we're in, you know, we're in the, the midst of a pandemic, but how long has this pandemic been going on for and how long will it go on for? Of course, don't know. I understand there's a problem, yeah. but, but, I, but I just feel like it could have been dealt with better. And yeah. hindsight's a great thing, but other countries have dealt with it in different ways and had miles better results. We've got one of the worst death tolls going. So it proves, the proof's in the pudding, the way our country shouldn't have been trial and testing stuff and spending billions and billions of pounds on stuff that hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. And then you eventually get nine months, eight, 10 months down the line and go, we think this is the best way. And yeah. it's, uh, but, <laughs> yeah. they're, but they're doing what they've been doing all yeah. the way through. It's not worked. New yeah. Zealand, for instance, bump straight in, lockdown, first instance. We dragged it on for about two months before yeah, we did yeah. anything like that and let it get too, they let the problem get too far down the line. And then it was hard to reel it back in. Sweden, you know, they went for herd immunity. They had problems where it rose and stuff like that, but they've got a, a lower death toll. So listen, there's low, we're going all day about it. We can, we can get, I just, we can get I just, into that. I just, get in that, I just, that I just think that, that, <laughs> me, that mental health side yeah. of it, as, you know, and, and the other problems with yeah. other uh, diseases and stuff and illnesses has been neglected. But, um, but so amateur boxing clubs being shut down, amateur boxing for, for kids in general, when they, that's their only outlet, you know, sometimes, they don't like school, they've not got a great home life, and then all of a sudden, at night time, they look forward Monday, Wednesday, Fridays to go to that boxing club because it's their outlet. Yeah. And after training, they feel better. They've been shut for 12 months. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's bad times. It is, it is. It's, uh, I see, like you said, some people are lucky and some are not, and it's, it's a bit unfair. But growing up for yourself, you know, you know, with all the violence, and, and especially around Manchester, Salford, did, did you ever, like, sort of go down that road as a, as a youth, what yeah, brought you to I, boxing? I, I ended up um, 
like like I say, I was brought up well, and I, me mum and dad was both there, was both working, good home life in terms of like structure, but. You get dragged in with the crowds, your mates are going doing stuff, you just tag along because that's what you did. Um, but I always watched a bit of boxer, I, you know, all the way through. Ever since my dad sat me down and watched Nigel Ben and Michael Watson, fell in love with boxing, and yeah. for three years I was mithering at him saying, come and go boxing, but we didn't have a car, so he couldn't get me to a boxing gym. And then, uh, and then one of my mates rang me, Chris Mahoney, who was, used to go to school with me, he rang me and said, there's a boxing gym opening tonight, do you fancy going? So I went on the first day, first day it opened up, and I was there for seven years, and then, and it changed my life. It, 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 it sounds mad, this, but, when I, so I got caught robbing cars with my mates, and, um, and my mum come to the police station, and he expected her to fucking hammer me, do you know what I mean? She said the worst thing what she could ever say to me. She didn't shout at me or scream or anything, she just sat me down and she just went, I can't tell you how disappointed I am in you and just looked me straight in the eye and I was like, oh, you, you could have stabbed me in the heart then, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'd have rather have battered me. Painful, innit? Oh, it was horrible. It, it, yeah. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I'll never do anything like that again because I didn't want to upset her, do you know what I mean? And then I went to the amateur boxing club and my, my coach Dave, he said, uh, what have you been up to and all that? And I was, I was like 15 or something like that and I was like, oh. And he said, I promise you, you ever do anything like that again, you'll never step foot in this gym again. So that was the icing on the cake then. I thought, I've upset my mum, yeah. and to top it off, I won't be able to go boxing again. So that was it. So that was my, me back on the, on the right path. So even though it seems like a little thing that to people, yeah. when you're obsessed with boxing, and you've got, you know, you, you, you don't want to upset your mum, them little things set me back on the right path, whereas I probably would have ended up going down the wrong one. Yeah, because your world becomes like really small. I remember like, it's like, when people shut the door, that's it, I'd rather, you know, I've been battered. Jamie had been beaten and I'd been like, it calls all kinds of names. But when, like, my mum said, you know what, Bill? You've really hurt me there. You know, the your, worst, world, your world becomes really small. Yeah. I've had people wanting to shut doors. I've got nowhere to go. So, your story's like, you know, you, had that, you made that decision of like, right, okay, so I can either continue doing what I'm doing, upsetting, hurting people, or I can change my life yeah. and I can start boxing. And, you know, well, for you, you did do that, you know what I mean? So yeah, what was your yeah. boxing career like in the amateurs? What was the amateur days like? Because I know, like, you're probably the same era as me when you talk about Michael Watson and Nigel Ben. Yeah, I used to yeah. sit up and watch Mike Tyson. Loved it. Because it was on the trend back then, remember? Obsessed with Tyson. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, to, to, to Dodson sat behind the camera. I think he, he was the same. He was all obsessed with Tyson at that time. He was, a, he was an animal. And, yeah. um, and, and I wanted to be Tyson, without a doubt. You know, <laughs> I, I, when I was a young kid thinking I was Mike Tyson, thinking I was Nigel Ben. Um, but I think by the time I got to 17, 18, I was like a, developed like a full, like yeah. I am now. Um, even when I was probably the last day in, year in high school. But in the amateurs, I didn't really start developing any proper skill until I was about 17. So I was physically about 16, I was strong. I got beat off Ricky in the, in the junior the ABAs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, Rick, Ricky and he, he bashed me up and stopped me in a round. Um, one round. One round, bashed yeah. me up. Me, me, me. So what happened was, I got drew against him in the, in the, in the, when, when we weighed in, and my amateur coach said, listen, I'm going to pull you out. You've been drew against Ricky Atten. And I was like, who's Ricky Atten? <laughs> he said, oh, mate, he said he's an animal. They call him the, the, the rib cruncher or something, he said. Yeah. <laughs> I said, who is it? He went in there, and he had like a flat top. <laughs> and I said, him with a flat top? He went, yeah, I went, I'll fucking fight him. Yeah. I said, he's not pulling me out against him. <laughs> and he went, no, no, honestly, he's really good. I went, mate, do not pull me out, I'll fight him. Yeah. Anyway, he said, right, I'll tell you what, I'll let you fight him, but if you're getting hurt, I'll towel you. Yeah. I'd had nine fights or something, and Ricky had won like four national titles or something like that. And I'm thinking, if he hurts me, I don't understand what he means, you know what yeah. I mean? And then, gets in there, round one, comes out, and that usually before that, it's just like headless chickens going for it. Yeah, yeah. At my level, yeah. Ricky sort of slipping, slipping, whack, hits me with a left up downstairs. I remember thinking, fucking hell, what was that? Yeah. Never been in a body shop before. And then afterwards, so he bashed me up, um, dropped me with an headshot, got up, bashed, bashed me up on the ropes, and then Dave threw the towel in. And I remember thinking afterwards, fucking hell, them body shots are all right. I'm going to start using them myself, you yeah. know what I mean? And then as my career went on and when I was a professional, that sort of, I brought, a big part of my game, what I brought in, and uh, 
And even in the amateurs, to be honest, I stopped a few of the body shots after that because I learned the lessons from him. Yeah, that's it's yeah, because he's known for that way, isn't he? Big hitter on the hard body shots, he was here. Uh, and he really turned out to be a world champion. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, no, so. but, of, but he came up to me afterwards after, and it only lasted a minute and a half, two minutes, whatever. And uh, he said, listen, I know it only went around, and he said, but he was doing well he said, up until I, I hurt you. He said, don't give up, Mike, I think you'll do all right. Just a little line like that of someone who... That's you, nice, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, and yeah. it kept me on the straight. And now his dad came up to me and said the same thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we was all around that area. There was, there was loads of good fighters around that, yeah. air, that era. Uh, in Manchester and Liverpool around there, and uh, I boxed in Liverpool a few times to be honest, and yeah. I always went, always went down well. And when I turned pro, I won the British title in Liverpool, yeah, and, and uh, the crowd always seemed to support me, even though I was boxing a, a scouser yeah. for, the, for the British title at the time. It seemed like I, I, I turned them on my side, so I've always had a bit of a good relationship with the scousers. But the moral of the story is never judge a book by its cover, isn't it? No, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> Ricky Hammond with his flat top, thinking, you the you're joking you? me, exactly. <laughs> turned out to be one of the hardest bastards I've ever fought, you know I'll, what I mean? So, so was that your first loss, or...? No, I'd lost my first fight. Uh, you'd lost your first so, fight, so... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I use it as an, that as an example. Yeah. The first fight I lost as a pro, the first fight I lost as, as an amateur. I think it tells a lot about your character, what you don't really understand, and, and, and what, how it is by nature, because why do we want to be fighters in the first place? What makes us watch people fight on TV and go, fucking hell, I fancy some of that. Just doesn't make sense, does it? You know what I mean? So it's something inbuilt, it's like an instinct. And then, so you go, you go to the gym, you do it, you're all right at it, you, you do well, and then you get in there, you're under pressure, you're shitting yourself, everyone shits yourself, everyone's watching, your mates have all come buy tickets and all that. I got stopped in the second round in, me, in the, my first fight. Yeah. So that in itself, then that experience, you'd think, that put you off for fucking life, that. Do you know what I mean? But so what then makes you go away and be that obsessed with something? So this is what happened with me. And, I did, and, and I've only sort of thought about this recently over the last few years, analyzed it, looked back and I thought, it was six months before I fought again. But I remember going back to the gym and I remember thinking, if I ever fight again, I need to be miles fitter and I need to listen to my trainer because he was telling me what had happened if I did what I did and it happened. Yeah. So I need to trust him more. So I went and I trained my bollocks off and I listened to everything Dave said. I actually boxed Anthony Farnell in yeah. my second fight and, um, and I won. I beat him, but, but it, to me, the situation... he was decent, Anthony Farnell. Good then. fighter, Anthony, really yeah, good fighter, yeah. But what made that situation worse was I'm from Walkden in Salford, and in Walkden there was a, set, a place called Pembroke Halls at the time, it's gone now. The fight was there, so my second fight ever is in front of all my schoolmates. So there's only my mum and dad and my sister and maybe two of my mates who was there when I lost the first fight, which was in Blackpool. The second fight is in Walkden. There's about 100 people there, and I, I'm telling everyone, I'm a boxer, so you're under loads of pressure and I fight Arnie. <laughs> He's a right good fight as well. Yeah. We'd knock shit out of each other and end up winning on points. So that, now if I'd have lost that fight, I reckon that would have sent me the other way. Yeah. I wouldn't have been the same then, you know what I mean? I think, fucking hell, I've had two fights, lost them both. Just lost in front it's of all my mates now. Yeah. I wouldn't have been, I don't think I'd have been, been able to save face. Yeah. Whereas then, it gave me the opportunity then to, so I went on, won a few fights, lost against Ricker. But then there was reasoning behind that, you know what I mean? So you sort of analyse it in your head and you go, all right, sound, yeah. but I've lost to someone who's four times national yeah. champion. But what, what's making him so good? Oh, fucking great body puncher, he dumped me there. <laughs> Say what, I'll start doing that. So, so what you do is you pick up these little lessons, you don't yeah. realise what you're doing at the time. It's experience. They're all, they're all life yeah. experiences, yeah. you know what I mean? And then eventually when you get to this stage, you connect the dots backwards and then you go, that's why I've ended up here. That's why I ended up a body puncher because of Ricky Hatton. Yeah. That's why I ended up a stubborn bastard because by nature I must be that character. No one said to me, go back boxing, don't give up now, carry on and keep going. No one said it to me once, yeah. but... I said it to myself, so that means you, that must be something what's inbuilt in me. Yeah. I don't know why. It's just, it's just a kind well, of. You tell yourself, innit? You know, you tell yourself that you're gonna do something, you're gonna achieve it, you're gonna do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. See, yeah. I was like sort of at the opposite end of of, of of your my career. Like my first five fights, I won. It was like I thought I was saying to the 
to Sony Sean before. I thought it was unbeatable. Yeah. You know what you do? You get. You do, yeah. I'm only a kid, right? I'm getting my ego stroked by by trainers and yeah, and, yeah. and all my um, my boxing mates. They're all you know. And I, I I trained in Liverpool and it was the Saint Ambrose back then. It was, it was the Gemini now. Um, but yeah, it was a great club. It yeah. still is. And um, I thought that's it. I went to Ireland, the boxed in Cavan against this kid, and it was the first time that I had to wear an head guard yeah. in uh, overseas because it was uh, it was compulsory over in, in in Ireland, and the kid kept pulling it down, but he was coming forwards, and I put him on his knees in the first round, and I thought, you know, I've got this all day. It was a tennis show, yeah, yeah. But it was like just buzzy, you know what I mean? It was just like it was just a buzzy show, and I lost on a majority decision, and that crucified me. Yeah, yeah. But then I lost again. You know, Character building though, innit? Yeah. So like, when I lost my first pro fight to Scott Dixon. I watched that this morning. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's fresh. You, you, what, right, you were saying there about yeah. ego stroking and, and giving you that false sense of security. Without a doubt, that's what happened with me. And I think that's a big problem in pro boxing. I, I, the lessons I got in my own career, I take him on board now and I use with my fighters. So Steve Wood and MTK, when they're managing him, I always saying, can we make sure we get um, all the boxes ticked on the way through? So Akib Fias, for instance, as an example, he came in as part of Carl Frampton before, when Carl was fight, uh, training for Josh Warrington. First day he come here, I'd asked Nige to get me an amateur who was a good pressure fighter, who'd be able to put it on him for three or four rounds, and then I'll use him to mix him in with someone else. A minute into it, He's all over Frampton like a rash. Yeah. He's only 18. And I'm, I'm going tonight. Who the fuck's this kid? And he went, oh, mate. He said, good fighter, pressure fighter. I said, he, he said he'll do something, I'm telling you now. And then he said, he wants to come and turn over with us when he comes over. I said, we'll have him all day long, you know what I mean? So when he's turned over, I've been saying to Steve, Steve Wood manages him, I've been saying to him, we need to make sure we match this kid right because if we do what we did with me, get matched pretty soft in with your generic journeyman who, who's fucking had 100 fights, lost 90, who just basically there to survive, they don't teach you any lessons. Mm. You're better off fighting or, or matching them with people who aren't, who are okay, who've, who've got like a 60% wins, but they'll learn more lessons from it. So we've matched that kid like that. We've matched him in a way because that's what we, with me, with Scott Dixon, the 12 fights I had before that, I didn't learn anything. I didn't have to adapt. I didn't have to um, overcome any sort of obstacles at all. I battered them, they tucked up, they survived sometimes, yeah. a lot of the times they didn't, and that was it. And then all of a sudden I got in there with Scott Dixon and I, I jumped down his throat, battered him, dropped him, tried to finish him like yeah. I'd done with all the other I've 12. It, yeah. <laughs> and he went, fucking not tonight, mate. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm here to win. And he fucking dug his heels in. He taught me how to be brave. Yeah. Because I tell you now, I wasn't brave enough that night. I wasn't, I, I wasn't fit enough and I, I was overtrained. I could see, still. yeah, I could see that because in the third round, you, you know, you put them down. With the I body shot, over. And I thought, that's it. You know, obviously, you know, I knew the result because it was an old But I'd not, been a, I'd not been taught any lessons, Bill. Yeah. So, so I, I'd never been in a situation in a pro ring where I was tired. I had someone try to give me back and there was another six, seven rounds to go. And I had to weather a little bit of a storm. Never been there. So I panicked. And so mentally I fell apart as much as physically I was tired and I was overtrained. But I thought to myself, you fucking panicked then. And, you, and, and he was warm, he was fucking horrible. So there was loads of factors, but it was the same for him. Yeah, he was experienced yeah. and he knew what was going to happen. He, he probably, you know, when I look at it from his point of view, he's going, say forward. some young yeah. kid jumped down my throat, punched himself out here, fucking good. You know what I mean? Wait till he gets in the next round and he's still got another six rounds to go. And that's what he did. I used that then in the rest of my career yeah. because I always used to think then, that, so Oliver, God rest his soul, was my saving grace. He, he got me after that fight and he went, what are you doing? You've got all the talent in the world, but you try to do it in that much time when there's that much time. He said, and when you go to the ropes, or how do you defend yourself if you do that? That's no good. You're never going to get anywhere by doing that. You need to properly defend yourself. And I was, I was thinking, no one's ever said that to me ever. 
And I swear to God, he broke it down, he analysed it. And tactically, he was an absolute genius. I can't have it. I've never come across anybody who's broke a fight down as good as him. And, um, and then for two years nearly then, I went and trained with him full time. There was only me and him in the gym. A mate of mine, Shinny, used to come training, a lad called Daz Cleary. Shinny? Shinny, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and um, there was only us in the gym. So it was like them two years was probably worth 10 years with someone. Because for me to have one-on-one -on -one time with him and get that knowledge out of him on my own with no other distractions, it was fucking priceless, you know what I mean? So I feel like that was like boxing's version of fucking Harvard University, being able to have that time with him. And, uh, and then as the gym grew and uh, as sort of our success went on and I started doing well, won the British title, the gym started growing. Steve Foster came, um, Anthony Farnell, Martin Murray, you know, we, we had a lot of fighters, Amir Khan came. Um, and then as time went on, then obviously Rocky Fielding come, uh, Martin, Tony Dodson, uh, the gym just grew and grew and grew. So you would have got less time with Oliver, yet I didn't need any more time with him because I took it all on board. And then it was just about putting it to practice each time then. Do you know what I mean? So, um, so I've been very, very lucky in in my boxing career at that point, where I got them lessons early on, I got to put into practice. So I was in fight the air three times. I won two of them against Michael Jones and against uh, Matthew Macklin. And if you look at situations in them fights, so watch the Scott Dixon fight and watch how I lost the fight and then watch that scenario and then put it into clips with the Michael Jones fight and the, the Matthew Macklin fight you'll see areas of them fights where I'll took them lessons from that and that's why I won them fights. So I'm glad, I'm glad that I experienced that loss because the old saying, it's never a loss as long as, long as you learn from it. I took so much from that. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. I was talking to a kid who boxed here the other day. I've known him for a few years, now Richie Murray. No, oh, yeah. yeah. I know Richie, I've seen <laughs> yeah. him. Yeah, he said to me. Have you seen him during lockdown? Yeah, I said to Richie, he said, uh, I said so you, you fought Jamie? He went, yeah, I just located my shoulder. She said he got stopped. Yeah, yeah. She's unfortunate, you know what I mean? It's weird because in the amateurs, I had a load of first round wins. Yeah. With body shots, a lot of the time was with body shots. The only first round win he ever had as a pro was against him and his shoulder come out. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> well, so fortunate for him. During like... lockdown, first lockdown, I was on a bike ride with my son yeah. going through Salford Keys. And as I drove past him, I saw a double look and he went, Jamie. I went, fucking hell, Richie Murray. I'd yeah. never seen him since the night I fought yeah. him, but I just recognised him and I stopped and had a chat with him and all that. It's nice. So who was your, um, your, your, your strongest opponent that you'd been up against? As a pro, the best, the, the, the toughest, toughest opponent was Matthew Macklin. Mac Hardest puncher was a kid called Delroy Mellis, yeah. who was a bit of a journeyman, win some, lose some, but could fucking hit. Uh, I fought him in Everton Park Sports Centre, actually, yeah. and, um, and, it, and that was a bit of a ding-dong. But, but without a doubt, the most, the toughest, most competitive man I've ever fought is Matthew Macklin. Yeah. What a stubborn bastard. How did that turn out? Unbelievable fight. I knew, I knew it was going to be that sort of fight. So Billy Graham, I trained a lot with Billy Graham. At the end of me, towards the end of my amateurs, I was working delivering beer. Mm. And, um, and my depot was round the corner from the Phoenix camp. So I used to do my run, get all the deliveries done. And instead of going back to work for my dinner, my dinner hour, I'd go in the Phoenix camp and I'd sit there with Billy and have a chat with him. My, my working shifts were, um, I had Monday, Tuesdays off and work Saturday, Sundays, because obviously pubs and stuff needed the deliveries doing. So I'd go and train there on a Monday and Tuesday with the pros. Yeah. So I expected, I was gonna go with Billy Graham when I turned pro. And what happened was, I had my last amateur fight in Tenerife and Steve Wood, and Steve Foster was there watching the fight. I'd never met Steve Wood before. He'd only just set up his VIP promotions and the management. I lost the fight. Oh no, I didn't lose the fight. It was a draw. And I went, you can't have a draw. And he was like, now nah, in Spain, if we can't decide to draw, I said, you bent bastards. <laughs> so I jumped out of the ring and Steve Wood said, hey mate, I'm Steve Wood, Steve Foster's mate. Set up this management thing. You should go pro. Yeah. I said, alright, I'm doing. This was my last one. I'm turning pro. Prince Nazim Ahmed had set up a prom promotions company at the time, and Billy Graham's going to train me, so I'm going with him. And he said, uh, 
oh, I was going to say, why don't you come and see us? Like, I'll look after you. Salford lads and all that. So I was like, oh, I don't know. He said, listen, I'll tell you what then. When we get home, why don't you come and have a sit down with us for half an hour? I'll, I'll make you an offer. And then if you still want to go with them, sound, do that. So I said, all right, so I'll do that. Goes and sees him. And so you're talking, when was this? 1999, so it was yeah. 22 years ago. Long time ago, wasn't it? 22 yeah. years ago, he said to me, listen, if you come and sign with me, I'll make sure you'd have six fights in the first year. I'll give you the £1,000 a fight. I'll get you the sponsor, and I'll get you the sponsor car. So I was like, <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> That's, that's great, you yeah, know what I mean? Not until that league, you, yeah. you look at some pros turning over, now we were yeah. doing four rounders for a grand. So, um, so I was thinking, ah, that's too good to turn down that. Yeah. So I went and spoke to Billy. Billy told Leslie, I think you're making a mistake, you should come with me and all that, I, which I understood because I've been training with him for a couple of years. But Steve Wood and Billy Graham didn't get on. So Steve said, why don't you come and train here with Michael Brody and Ray Farrell? So that's what I did. So he got me a sponsor car, got me a sponsor for 400 quid a month, and, and, and I boxed nine times in the first year, which like, it was, was unbelievable really, but, you know, he kept me that busy. So I was on his own shows, I was on Frank Warren shows, and I was on Frank Maloney shows. And then, um, but when, when I look back now, we both got a bit carried away. Steve, because I could fight and because I was knocking people over, stopping people who don't get stopped, everyone got a bit carried away but I didn't get them lessons what I needed. Yeah. And then we sort of tried to run before I could walk, got beat, slowed it down a little bit. Matt Troom took me on um, because Frank Warren binned me off at, at the time. And, um, and then really it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I was with Matt Troom at a time when, you know, the, the universe did its work and, and um, British Art had become vacant. I was training for a fight in the undercard. Paul Samuels pulled out, injured. And then I got, I got through in there at five days' notice. I won the world title, well, the, the, the British, British title. title, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So, you know, your career going forward, you've like, um, how many fights did you, did you end up having? Just I had 37 fights, 132. 37? So, 37, 132, yeah. It's a brilliant, brilliant track record. Yeah, did all right, yeah. Well, you win some, you lose some, as they say. Yeah, and, and, and do you know what it was like? So, I got disqualified yeah. against Michael Jones, which goes down as one of your losses. I lost on an injury to Wazid that I'm where my hip went, so that's one. And I can genuinely say you know, I, I lost two fights legitimately. Yeah. Lost to Scott Dixon, lost to Ryan Rhodes. Yeah. There was reasons, but I lost fair and square. You, that was you it. Believe, yeah, they were the ones you believe you won. And then the other one, the la my last fight ever, yeah. I was winning a fight. I was in a, you know, so, so I retired at 30. I think I just turned 31 when I actually retired, but decided I was retiring at 30 because my brain scan had changed. Yeah. And I'd been in fight of the year three times. Um, and I'd spoke to Rob Smith from the board and he said, listen, it's a natural change. So you're safe to box. You can keep fighting, no problem. If you're worried, get a second opinion and see what they say. Yeah. So I did, got a second opinion, sat down with this guy, giving me scans. And he said, um, I told him I was boxing uh, I think it was May, March, I think I boxed in 2010. And I said, ideally, I want you to let me know your opinion before my next fight. Because if it's a, you know, a drastic one, then I'd like the decision whether to fight on or not. Yeah. So I'm boxing on the Saturday. I gets a phone call on the Monday off his secretary saying, I'm just wondering why you didn't turn up for your appoint appointment on Friday the doctor's aware that you wanted to speak to him before your next fight. So I said, I didn't, I, I've never had an appointment. So there was a mix up for whatever reason. So she said, well, he's aware that you want to see him before the, you, you have the next fight. Can you make it down before his first appointment this, this morning, quarter to nine? So my son was off um, school. He had an ear infection, he was only little, it was only five, four or five or something. So I said, right, I'll have to bring my son down though. So goes down there, sits down. So he basically said, listen, they're right, it's the part of your brain what can change naturally over a period of time, but it's also the part which is affected, it affects um, coordination, speech, memory, and, you know, let's, let's not beat around the bush. You've been boxing for nearly 20 years, yeah. and you've been in fight of the year three times. The, it's hard to move on. This, it's probably caused yeah. from boxing. So there's no, te there's no telling what's gonna happen down the line. You might be totally fine, 
or the longer you go in in boxing, potentially, you know, you're putting yourself at risk. Yeah. So I said, so what do you suggest? He said, my advice to you would be to get out of boxing as soon as you can. So I sort of looked at my son, and he's only five, bless yeah. him, you know what I mean? And he, and, and he just sort of looked at me and went, and I thought, you know what, I'm fucking done. So this is on the Monday, and I'm boxing on the Saturday. So I goes to the gym, tells Oliver the conversation, and I says, so I'm going to box on Saturday, and that's me done. So he said, right, OK, good decision, sound. So it was the only fight I ever had where every time I got hit, I thought about getting hit. Yeah, because he was conscious of Because he was demo. conscious yeah, of it. Yeah. So I shouldn't have been in there. Yeah. In hindsight now, I should never have took the fight. I took the fight because I was skint, which is mad when you think about it, but I was skint. I needed the money. And what happened was, at the end of the sixth round, we was having a bit of a set to. I got hurt a little bit of a body shot. But when I watched the fight myself, I can see I don't want to be there. Yeah. My body language isn't right, you know what I mean? So Oliver gets me back to the corner, he says, you okay? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he went, right, so he gave me the full minute and he just sort of went, right, stand up. So he went, big deep breath. So, sort of big deep breath and he went, that's it, we're done. And I went, what do you mean? And he went, that's it, we're done. And he just turned around and shouted the ref, he went, we're done. Yeah. And I remember thinking, thank fuck for that. Do you know what I mean? Because I didn't want to be there. No. Yeah. I'd done what I had to do. And when I had a conversation with him in the changing rooms after, I said, what? I said, why did you pull me out? And he went, I could just tell you didn't want to be there. He said, me and you can have a conversation without speaking. Yeah. And he was right. Just knows you. He was right. I didn't want to be there. So I, I sort of look at our relationship and the way, the way our bond, what we had. I always try and replicate that with my fighters. Look at Tommy, that fight in Madison Square Garden. I knew he was going to fucking go mad when I pulled him out. But he'd lost, he'd gone past the point where he, was got, he had a chance of winning the fight, and I knew him. I yeah. knew by his body language yeah, strong, he'd gone. Yeah. But he'd never, he'd never quit. Yeah. He's too brave for his own good. So I had to do it, even though I knew he was going to go fucking mad. But that's knowing your fighter. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's dead important, I think, because it's my job to protect you. You know what I mean? So it's my job to, to try and get you to win a fight. Yeah. But more importantly, sure it's more importantly, yeah, yeah. it's me getting you out there safe and back home to your family. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that decision to end your, um, your career and retire. So, you know, you moved over. Did, when did you start moving to, like, Marbella and stuff and training over there? Because you started training. I read about it and it was, uh, it was quite interesting. And it was quite, you know, must have been a tough time over there as well. Yeah, no, happened. so I, I started training Tommy over here. Tommy, Tom, we had one little six-rounder and then Tommy boxed um, Derry, Denny Matthews for the Commonwealth title. Did really well and then, and then ended up walking onto one in the 10th round and got knocked out. But because Tommy did so well, uh, Matt, Matt Macklin was over training back with Joe Gallagher and I'd asked him to sign me a picture. And, um, and I've gone for a coffee with him, ended up with him for about four hours, ended up going out for food and all that and talking. And he was asking me about Tommy, saying, fucking hell, you did a great job with him there training. Um, so week after, he sent me a message saying, listen, I'm just wondering whether you fancy training me, um, but it'd be out in Marbella. So I was like, you know, difficult decision because I've got a f missus and kids at home and family and stuff like that. But, you know, he was, he was with Lou DeBella on HBO, he was earning good money, so it sort of made sense for me to do it. And he said, listen, I understand how close you are to your family, so if you'll do it, we'll do it for six weeks at a time and I'll fly you home every weekend um, so you can see the kids. So that just sort of sold it to me, and I thought, you yeah. know, because what a story it was, because of the fight me and Macklin had had as well. So, uh, so I went out there. Um, we had we had a fight in Atlantic City. Had that one, came back, was training for. Um, he was boxing Daniel Gill. Um, Gill pulled out about two weeks before the fight, um, which, in, in, as it turns around, he ended up pulling out. He pulled out injured, but then ended up taking the Golovkin fight. So it was obvious, like that was sort of in the background. <laughs> So then in that time, Ed, um, Macklin signed with Matt Troom. Um, I started going back over there, um, training Macklin, and that's when, that's when the incident happened then. So it was yeah. the only weekend I was ever there. So you stayed that weekend? And so I stayed that weekend. And you ended only, up getting shot? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> fucking sod's law. That's what I mean. It was yeah. Like, literally, I've been, 
going there from the November before, and this is in the August, so yeah. 10 months sort of time. So that's 2014, wasn't it? 2014, yeah. And you, took a, you took a bullet in the hip. Yeah, so, in I was out, so, coming, so we've gone out, it was Danny Vaughan's birthday, we've gone out, comes, comes in, walks into the place where I was staying, and then just from behind the car, someone come out and fucking shot Think me. they were looking to kill you? Or was it just? Well, it's not it, like obviously, yeah. It's nothing to do with me. Yeah. It's like obviously wrong, wrong place at the wrong time. Um, but you know, they've they've obviously realised it's not me. They've yeah. got the wrong person because they've left me. But yeah, so they fired, they fired, three, they fired three, three bullets. Yeah. I got hit twice. Um, but then they've ran. They've left me. I vaguely remember it because I was pissed. Yeah, yeah. I think to, to be honest. Bill, my saving grace that night being buried is being pissed yeah. because I can barely remember it. I can remember bits, but it's, it's, it's blurry and it's not unclear. So it's my saving grace because who the fuck would want to remember that? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, and, and I've got nerve damage in my leg. Um, I've got a bullet in my hip, which I struggle with because mm. we, we think because it's like every time I fucking get out of the car, it clicks and it's painful. But I'm here. Yeah. I'm here, sat talking to you. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and well, it's a miracle. It's that's, it that's that's the fucking the main thing. It's like you know, I've had. Um, I'm not one of those interviewers who who have an experienced life and the shit that happens. Yeah, to yeah. Me. I've been. I've had bullets which passed me. You know, when I was in Thailand, I've been stabbed in the chest. I've, I've had it close to my heart. Yeah. And I'd be fucking the earpiece off. I know what it's like. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, that for me, that was my lifestyle. Yeah. No, it, obviously, it's not your lifestyle. No, you're, yeah, you're yeah. You're thrust into something, you're, uh, an incident uh, in an environment which is like frightening. It yeah. is, right. you know. Uh, but and like you said, you know, you're shaming but, grace with being pissed, and that's like an anaesthetic, and it takes mate, away. Mate, it's ma massively because. So, uh, what had happened was, five weeks before it happened, I'd had an hernia operation. Yeah. So, I've woke up the next morning, and so I've, I'm obviously been heavily sedated and I'm, I'm coming round, I'm looking round and, and I start to realise I'm in the hospital and, uh, and these, these nurses walking round and, I, and then I'm, I'm, I'm start, trying to focus on this nurse and she's talking, she's talking fucking Spanish and I'm thinking, where the fuck am I? So I really didn't know where I was for, the, for a while and then I've looked down and I'm, and I'm going, Phew. and I remember thinking, fucking hell, I just had the hernia operation because I didn't, I didn't know what was going on and then so I realised, so, so one of my legs was totally bandaged and one of my legs was in like a brace. And then I was thinking, what the fuck's happened? And then I thought, wow, fuck me. It, it came to me, I remembered it fucking happening and I went, wow, thank fuck I'm here. So one of the, one, I was in hospital for nearly a week in Marbella. My missus flew over, me, mum and dad, the next day. And all week, she's trying to get me home. And the insurance, who I was insured with, was fucking messing about. They was messing about because they was trying to save money. They was trying to get me on a commercial airline. And then she sort of figured it out, my missus. She's gone fucking mad and said, listen, are you telling me you're jeopardising my husband's health to, to save yourself money? Yeah. And then literally a few hours later, they booked me a fucking private flight home and, and got me home. But um, the worst part of it was, I was in the ambulance. On the, so they put me in an ambulance and took me to the, straight onto the tarmac at, at the airport. And when I was in the back of the ambulance, I sort of was having flashbacks of on the night. And I remembered being in the back of the fucking ambulance, crying. Yeah. To, sort of saying about my kids and stuff like that. So, uh, so it was fucking horrible because before that, I could barely remember anything after sort of remembering walking down and whoever it was coming out and, and do, you know, like firing the gun. So, um, so that was fucking tough. And I think that's what's made me realise the less I remember about that, the better. Yeah. Because I reckon you'd need fucking counselling, do you know what I mean? Definitely, it's like, it's traumatic, isn't it? It's therapy stuff, that, it's like... Definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I'm just sitting here listening, thinking, wow, you know, the fact that you're in that ambulance and, and the fear that you must have been going through, but you're, you're blocking it out. Yeah, Because yeah. that's the easiest thing to do. 
This it is, is your passion. Yeah. I think, I think what helps, helps you deal with it is, is that sort of glass, glass half full mentality. So, fuck, of course, no one wants to be in that situation. Fucking certainly not when, for, for no reason, like it, it, by mistake. Yeah. But, but then you've got to go, oh, fuck me, I'm on my way home to the kids. Yeah. Could have been fucking miles worse than that. Do you know what I mean? Right, my leg's fucked and, it, you know, it, I'm, but guess what? I've I bought a fucking foot support yeah. and they told me I'd never run and now I can run. So everything, everything what's got a negative, if you try and put a positive spin on it, yeah. then it, that thought process about, Fucking, why has this happened to me? It doesn't become that. It becomes, thank fuck, I'm still here so I can go running. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's about having that right sort of mindset. You can always, you can always put a positive spin on it. There's like, like, fucking hell, why have I lost the fight? Well, hang on, let's not look at it like that. Let's look at it, right, listen, I've lost the fight, but let's yeah. take the lessons from it. Yeah. You've always got to be able to put that positive spin on it. Well, that's a good way of putting it, really. You know what I mean? To say, like, um, did you ever get to get interviewed and all that by the police. Yeah, they come, the, the, the police come to... Spanish police? To, to, yes, <laughs> Spanish, Spanish police came, um, interviewed me, asked me what happened, told them, told them everything, what I could remember. And then, and, then, and then what they said was, listen, we'll be in touch and we'll, we'll, we'll get some investigations going and we'll be in touch. Now, I've not heard one thing from the Spanish police since I got home. They also said to me, uh, the British police will come and interview you when you get back. In, in hospital and they'll take a statement and stuff like that. And that never happened. So, listen, I don't know, but I just went, listen, I don't care. I'm okay, fucking home. I'm, I'm yeah. home, I'm going to my kids. Listen, what, what, I'm just fucking blessed. Yeah, well, you are, it's, uh, it's like I said, it's frightening. Um, and how did you, um, how long did it take you before you could walk again properly? So, again, this is, Definitely down to the reason why we're fucking boxers and fighters and stuff like that. It's that inbuilt thing where you don't know, even know where it comes from. I, so for, for the first sort of six months, they told me after about four weeks, you'll start getting movement in your foot because they opened my leg up at the back. Yeah. Um, and they said, we've checked to make sure your nerve hasn't been hit. And it's not. So it's fully intact. So what will happen is it's in trauma and then when it realises there's no damage, it'll start to move again. So four weeks, five weeks, six weeks comes, there's no movement in it. So I'm on crutches still. Yeah. And in that time, I'm training Tommy, but Nigel's doing a lot of the physical stuff. And, and then Ricky Boylan, who was, I'd met out in Marbella, he was down there sparring with Tommy, and he asked me if I could train him for a fight. So this is talk about everything happens for a reason. For a reason. Ricky Ball and I saw and I'd met Mike Hayton years before. I was the first boxer to go and see Mike Hayton because they had a wrist problem. Yeah. Right? Mike Hayton now treats all the top boxers for hand injuries. So I've rang Mike and I said, listen, I've got a boxer here, he's got a bit of an hand problem, can I have a look at him? So he said, yeah, so I takes him down that night, gets there, I'm on my crutches. <laughs> so this is, I think this was five months after, after it had happened. He said, fucking hell, are you still on crutches? Said, yeah, yeah. He said, why, what's happened? So I said, well, my foot's not moving. They told me it was nerve was in trauma and it had not been it, but he's not thinking it. So he's, so he's going, that doesn't seem right to me. He said, are you not under anyone over here? So I said, listen, I was, but the physio was terrible with the NHS. So I've been just going and seeing a private physio, but they've signed me off. So he said, nah, he said, that needs looking at. He said, do you want to come to a super clinic? So I said, what the fuck's a super clinic? So he said, at the FA base, every three months, 12 of the best specialists in the country meet up and are presented with cases what people can't, can't, yeah, they yeah. say, we can't help you anymore. He said, a lot of the time we can't help him, but a lot of the time we can. He said, so I think there'll be someone there who might be able to help you. So I said, fucking def definitely, yeah. Goes down there, the week, uh, it's a month after with me and mum. And mum took me down there goes in, gets assessed by this physio for an hour, and he's filming all different stuff, what I can and can't do. And then they sent me out for 15 minutes to have a coffee, and then they called me back into this like boardroom, and all these specialists have sat round, and this physio presents this 
case on screen 15 minutes later to all these specialists, what I can, I can't do. And I've sat there thinking, fucking hell. <laughs> and then, so the guy who looked after me in the end is a guy called Dominic Power. He stands up and he goes, yeah, this is my one, this, innit? So he comes round, gets me lay on this table and he starts tapping down my leg. He said, when you, when you start feeling tingles in your foot, let me know. So I said, I can't feel my foot, can't feel anything. He went, you will, you'll feel it. So I'm thinking, he's fucking mad him. So he starts tapping down the back of my leg and then all of a sudden, woof, start getting all these fucking tingles in my foot. I said, right there. So he draws on my leg, does it from the bottom. Same thing happens, draws. So, he's, so he looks a bit confused and all that. He's saying, if they're saying your nerves intact, it doesn't make sense this and all that. So he said, come down to Birmingham in a couple of weeks. What I'll do is I'll go in with a camera and I'll have a look at what's going on and we'll see, we'll see where we can take it from there. So it goes down, goes in. So it gets there at seven in the morning and I'm in nine o'clock in the morning, I've gone for this finger. So it goes under, wakes up, the missus is there. It's nearly four o'clock in the afternoon and it's fucking going dark. So I'm like, like again, coming around from Anna's deck and I said, what the f what is it, fucking night time? So she went, oh, you've had a big operation apparently. So I was like, I thought he was just going in with a camera. She went, yeah, yeah. So he comes in and he said, oh, I've made a messy leg. <laughs> so I was like, what do you mean? He said, so I went in. Yeah. He said, so where the bullet's gone in, in the side of your leg and come out there? He said, I've gone in with a camera. He said, I've had to cut away more scar tissue than I've ever seen. Yeah. He said, so that took me two hours. He said, and then I sent a camera down to check your peripheral nerve, your main nerve. And he said, it was basically hanging on by a thread. He said, how they missed it in Marbella, oh. I don't know. He said, but there was no way you would ever get any movement back. He said, so I've took a sensory nerve at the back of your calf, took that out of there, I've grafted it in, I've double stitched it to make sure it's as tight as possible to give you the best chance to get some signal through that nerve. He said, but most of the time, when it's been that badly damaged, you don't get any recovery. So, so this is like seven months after it happened. Yeah. So 12 months later, I have a follow-up appointment. He said, all you can do now is physio, listen to your physio, try and, try and move it. The thought process from that to there, that's the only way you'll get movement back. But bear in mind, I'm in the gym every day still. So I've got yeah. a foot support thing on, helping walk around, and I'm walking around all the time, so I'm active. So the year after, I goes back, still no movement in it. And he said, listen, usually by 12 months, you'd have some, even if it was just a little flicker in your muscles, doesn't look like it's been successful. So he said, you know, moving forward now, what are your things? So I said, do you think I'll ever run? And he went, nah, you'll never run with your leg like that. So I said, I better fucking do. <laughs> and he went, listen, I hope you do. He said, but, I'm just being honest with you, yeah. usually when it's like that. So I, said, I sort of said, do you think I'll walk without a foot support? And he went, not like that. He said, listen, even if you get some movement, you always need some sort of support. So I went, right, okay. Three months later, so every single night I had a bath. I was in that much pain, nerve pain is, is horrendous. The only way it went was at night, if I got in the bath and it was hot, and every night I got out of the bath and I sat there for half an hour trying to move it. So one night I'm on the phone, I'm sat in the bed like that and I'm trying to move my foot and I could just see my shin muscle there flickering like that. So I shouts Colleen, I went, is my shin muscle on my finger there? She went, yeah, I went, fuck it. I said, that's when I'm trying to move my foot. Yeah. So I videoed it and I sent it, Dominic Power, emailed it him, put we have lift off, <laughs> put perfect, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Yeah. But he'd signed me off three months before. He just said, listen, that's it. But if you ever want an appointment, book an appointment. So, books an appointment. I think it was like 12 months after the last appointment. By this point, I'm walking around, finger, and I'd had like this like silicone foot support thing made so I could run. So, fucking goes down there, walks in. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, yeah, sound. He said, come on then, take it off. And I went, I ain't wearing one. And he was like, are you not? He went, you walked in all right then? I went, I know. I said, I fucking told you, didn't I? And he went, you know what? He said, honestly, I knew. He said, I couldn't say yeah. at the time because you don't want to give you false hope. He said, but 
athletes and soldiers always renowned for getting better results because of your mindset. He said, yeah. you just do not stop going. He said, and he, and he also said, being in the gym, being on your feet and being active will also play a massive part in it. That's, that's so that mindset, just that yeah. fucking stubbornness. But that's what you said, and it? it'd be from the beginning, the mindset about boxing and everything. My mate, uh, Darren, he uh, something similar, but he ripped his muscle yeah. on his leg and he said, look, he'll never build muscle on that leg again. And you know, with that mindset, because he's an athlete, he's a, he's, a, he's a bodybuilder, he's just professional competitions, and his leg had just gone. Yeah. He said it looked like a fucking Richmond sausage. He said that's how skinny it was. He said, but he built it up. He said next, he said a couple of years later, he was he, he'd won, like fucking Mr. Britain and Nabbit and everything. So there you go. It's it's the mindset. Of that's that's it is. amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. That's great. What a, what a story, you know, yeah, right? yeah. like of like recovery and perseverance and just moving forward. Because some people. This is what happens, it'll just be like, fuck it, give up. I think once you give up on anything, of course, it's, it, it, it's, it starts I, attacking Don't forget though, Bill, as well, lucky. Yeah. Lucky in the sense of the job I do yeah. and the situation I was in. Because if I was a nine to five or sat behind a desk on a computer, yeah. how am I activating that nerve to get going? You know what I mean? Lucky, my situation was lucky as well as your fucking mindset. Yeah. But I did, like, they told me I'd never run again and I fucking did the Great North Run. Yeah. So 18 months after it started moving, I did fucking half marathon. Do you know what I mean? I should have been doing it actually. I should have been doing it in the September after it happened in the August. Yeah. And um, when my missus came in the hospital in Marbella and she was upset and all that, I said, listen, not being funny, don't think I'll be able to do that fucking Great North Run next month. <laughs> she says, you're a fucking dickhead. Why don't you stop messing about? But you know, yeah, It must have been really difficult smiling. for your family though as well. I mean, I can imagine. You know, um, all that fear and you know, like heartache that the that's a suffer. You know I mean? Worst worst part, if anyone reads my book, there's a part in it of that chapter and he says something along the lines of um the Colleen's how, how how the situation unfolded from Colleen's point of view. And it's all Colleen's experience of from the point of Nige Travis was the one who went and knocked on our door and told her. From that point until she got to the hospital, sort of 16 hours later, she thought was dead. Yeah. She, no, obviously, worst case scenario. She didn't know what it was. She couldn't get hold of me in the hospital. She didn't know which hospital I was in. Just like what went through her head and my mum and dad's head. You just can't even imagine. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, we'll put links about your book. Uh, for those that don't know, can you give them the title of your book? It's called Mosey the Fighter's Fighter. Mosey the Fighter's Fighter. Mosey the Fighter's Fighter. Brilliant. Proper down to earth name. Yeah. Do <laughs> you know what, as well? Like, I was dead conscious of it, the way I wanted people to read it. And I, when they read it, I wanted it to sound like I, it was me talking. Yeah. So, fucking hell, I, I like, I, I, um, I did all the, what do you call it? What's the word for it? Dictating. Not the, not the dictating. The editing. Yeah, well, editing really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I sort of went through the all the transcript of it, and I was like changing everything, all, all the different sayings to the way I'd say yeah, it. Yeah. So, like for instance, I wouldn't say, "Dad said this." Yeah. I'd say, "Me dad said yeah, this." Dad said so this. I was changing all that. Do you know what I mean? I had like 23 pages of edit. Paul Zanoni wrote a book, so I've fucking never seen out like it in my life. But I just wanted it to make sure that it sounded like me. I never did. Yeah. So I, that's exactly what how mine was when I wrote my because I wrote mine in a jail shell, and I wrote it on, with, on a bit of pencil, a bit of paper, and started writing down. And I wrote it uh, in my words. And it's like you said, you know, you, you need to look at something and edit it. Uh, but once it went from, like, um, from the edits to, to publication, you know, it was my story, I knew that, but from, like, a transcript to a movie script, I had, I had um, some American screenwriter, great guy, great guy, American, um, done a few movies. He's done this film I played before dawn, but the script. Yeah. We were dealing with the script and we and he was he said that he said sent me the script and I was like, what? you sound like I sound like I'm a fucking yank in um yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. a tight. It has to be me. And he, the, that was the only I think that was the only um the, the controversy that we had was he like this and I I said, Look, it it I know it's it it sounds good for you, but it doesn't sound right yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even the actor. He said he wants to do a Scouse accent, and we, we had trouble with that. I thought, you know what? It's very, very difficult to mimic a Scouse accent no, if you're from out of town. I, I, I don't, I, Scousers, I think 
the re- obviously the Mankin Scouse thing is a football thing. Yeah, yeah. But I think the reason why there's that little bit of thing, we're very similar. You've got to have it's the character with the accent. It's yeah. not just because it's a lot of it, it's, it's a lot of mannerisms and so sort of your body language say, says a lot about I, thought, I fucking love scousers. Yeah. So has been mate, my mate since we were kids, you know what I mean? And we've we grew, we come through the sport together. I've always had a top relationship with scousers, but that Manx scouse thing, it goes back. It's just a it football thing. <laughs> but in a boxing from a boxing point of view, we've we've always got on great. Yeah, it's a northwest area. I boxed years ago, the area one, area two. It's uh, I think I got beat by a man. Yeah. Kid as well, know what I mean? They Over hated me <laughs> when I was an amateur. I, I, I only lost to one scouser, I think, and then uh, the rest of them I, I beat them all. But I always, he always used to be in Liverpool. Yeah. But you say, here's that fucking little prick from Salford again. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you doing? Uh, so what are you doing with your days these these days? We've been lucky, you know, Bill, because obviously professional sport. We've we've been allowed to train right through this because so this situation has been terrible, um, but. We, we've been so lucky like in, in the sense that we've been able to be here for a couple of hours a day and it just breaks your day up. Um, so, yeah, been lucky. We, we had like 10 fights during lockdown, which is fucking good when you, when you, can, when you consider if you're not with Matt Troom or Frank Warren, you're not getting a fight at the moment. So, so all my fighters were lucky enough to get out during lockdown, which is, which is a blessing because fighters have struggled. Have you got any world class? Fighters looking for titles. Well, I've got Frampton's fighting two week Saturday. Who's he fighting? Jamel Herring. Jamel Herring. Um, he sh- fought Josh Warrington, didn't he? Yeah, He's yeah. He gave up his title, hasn't he? He gave it That's up. Left, yeah, it, yeah. left it for Jazzer and Kid Gallagher. That's no? right, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand it. It's, it's yeah. poli- political reasons he wants that ring, ring magazine belt, so it's a good decision for his career. Um, he's, he's lethal though, and he's Josh. Josh, you're a good fighter. Great good fighter. fighter. Mate. Yeah, yeah, good fighter. Yeah. Um, he's fighting Saturday. What's going to fight Carl? Yeah, yeah, good fight, great fight. fight. Carl, Carl. Listen, Carl, Carl did well to come through the first three rounds. Yeah. You know, his decision making wasn't great in them first three rounds, but if he'd if he'd have got that better, it it would have been a closer fight. And I st- I believe he can he can beat him, but um, well, it's always going to be a tough fight because Josh is a high octane pressure fighter, tough, strong. Yeah. So uh, so it's always going to be a fight. But yeah, I've got Chantel Cameron. She's WBC world champion. And then I've got Jack Carter, who's, who's waiting for his uh, world title shot. He's mandatory for the WBO world title. So, and then I've got a, a gym full of fighters who are who coming through, who are, who are going to be the next ones as well. So, yeah, it's exciting times. You're keeping busy, aren't you? You're Real busy, busy yeah, yeah. Lucky, lucky. So, um, so, we're coming to the end. And I usually you know, ask the guest about any, any part and words of wisdom, any, any pearls of wisdom you'd give the youngsters that are coming through today. From a boxing point from, of view, from, from or from a life, life lived experience, just be positive. Like, like, obviously, if they watch this interview, they'll see it all the way through. But my, the, the, you can always put a positive on everything. There's, in every in every situation, experience just told me that in every negative, there's always either a lesson to take from it or always a positive in some way. So, um, so you know that that sort of mindset of having the glass half full. It's, it's, it's not always easy, and it's been difficult, especially during lockdown now and stuff like that, but um, but you've got to try and stay positive and, and keep it in that way, because regardless then, in the rest of your life, you'll always come across them bumps in the road and obstacles, what you'll come across. What are you going to do? Are you going to go, right, I give in, or are you going to find a way around it? Yeah. Because there's always a way around it, it just depends how long it is. That's it, yeah. But only so. you. I, I see it, and I think it's like uh, the attitude, the gratitude is like, you know, we're, we're blessed with a few short decades of, course. of life. Make we're not here long, are we? Just yeah, got to enjoy your life. That's it, you know, you can either get busy living or get busy dying. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And yeah. with that, thank you very much.